introducing the speaker. And anyone who wants to join later is welcome. It's my great pleasure to host our Professor Murat Tekal from Oral University. So he received his bachelor degrees in electrical engineering and mathematics from Boazic University with high honors and his master's and PhD in electrical computer and systems engineering from, uh, I hope I say it right, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, New York. He was with Eastman Kodak Company, Rochester, New York from December 1984 to June 1987 and then in New York from July 1987 to June 2005, where he was promoted to Distinguished University Professor. And since June 2001, he is a professor at Koch University Istanbul. He has been the Dean of Engineering at Koch University between 2010 and 2013. His research interests are in the area of digital image and video processing, including video compression and streaming, motion compensated filtering, super resolution, video segmentation, object tracking, content-based video analysis and uh, summarization, 3D video processing, deep learning for image and video processing, video streaming and real-time video communication services and software defined networking. He is an IEEE fellow and a member of Turkish Academy of Sciences and Academia Europea. He was named as Distinguished Lecturer by IEEE Signal Processing Society in 1998 and awarded a Fulbright Senior Scholarship in 1999. He received the Tubitak Science Award in 2004, the new edition of his Prentice Hall book Digital Video Processing 1995 is published in June 2015. He holds 10 US patents. His group contributed to technology, uh, to imaging standards. He participates in several European framework projects and is also a project evaluator for the European Commission and panel member for European Research Council. Yeah, that was a long bio. Uh, I guess he achieved a lot. <laughs> so uh, this is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Tekal and he will be talking about state of the art in deep learning for image and video restoration and SR. Thank you, Murat Oja. Thank you, Gözde, uh, for a nice introduction. So uh, what I will do today is to review the state of the art in image restoration and video restoration and super resolution. <clears throat> now, uh, I, I should start by saying that uh, I've been working on this problem uh, mainly image restoration problem uh, for more than 40 years. Uh, I did my PhD on image restoration. Uh, at that time, uh, there was no video. Digital video was not available as a technology at the time. Uh, so digital video became uh, popular, I would say, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and so we started also working on video restoration and super resolution uh, after the 1990s. Uh, well, uh, the state of the art has changed. Uh, and we are basically now using deep learning uh, instead of the classical model-based approaches. Uh, so I'll start with a brief uh, introduction to model-based approaches uh, for regularization of inverse problems. I will first define image restoration and super resolution as an inverse problem. And then I'll briefly mention, very briefly mention what we have done in the past uh, 40 years uh, until the advent of deep learning. And uh, after I say 2015 or so, uh, this field has completely changed. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And uh, I'll basically talk about three items uh, that affect the results of uh, learned image restoration and super resolution and also video restoration and super resolution. That's architectures, loss functions, and the training data uh, and generalization. So those are the three titles I would say I would emphasize during my talk. So let's start with the definition of the problem. Uh, inverse problems are problems where you're given y 
uh, which are noisy observations of degraded data, uh, and you want to estimate X, which is basically uh, the ideal image in our case, or the ground truth in basically deep learning terminology image. <clears throat> and uh, the relation between the observed image and the ground truth image uh, is basically uh, stated here as a linear uh, model, but it doesn't have to be a linear model. You can also add any point-wise nonlinearity on top of this. Uh, the deep learning approach would still work. Uh, but in the early days of classical model-based uh, approaches to the solution of this problem, uh, we wouldn't be able to deal with the nonlinearity uh, easily. Uh, so the linear model is generally assumed. And for most cases, the linear model is valid, actually. Uh, but you can also add a point by nonlinearity in certain cases to this observation. <clears throat> so uh, we have basically two matrices here. Uh, D is an observation matrix, which is mainly used for downsampling. And H is a Blur matrix. Uh, it's typically a toplet matrix, which basically models convolutional uh, blur degradation uh, applied to uh, the ground truth image. So we have a ground truth image, which is blurred and then downsampled possibly. Uh, and then we have additive noise on top of this. And this model actually covers uh, the following problems, image denoising. If you assume DNHR identity, uh, you have just noisy observations, and this is known as denoising problem. If there is no downsampling, uh, this identity, uh, this is generally known as deblurring problem uh, because you have just H, the blurring operator that blurs the image. And if we have D and H together, then it's a super resolution problem because you have now downsampled observations. And there's also the image in painting problem where part of the image data is missing. Uh, part or parts of the image data is missing. And your goal is to actually fill in this missing information, uh, missing pixels in the picture. Okay, so what we will be discussing today, the set of techniques uh, is a solution to all of these problems, uh, which are known as inverse problems. And uh, in the particular case of image super resolution, uh, well, this basically D matrix, the downsampling matrix, uh, is typically implemented uh, in MATLAB using the image resize uh, function, image resize function. And uh, it involves uh, bicubic filtering, but uh, let's say if you're doing a two by two downsampling, uh, the downsampling filter only affects those four, filter, uh, four pixels and reduces those four pixels into a single pixel. Uh, that's how the downsampling is implemented. Uh, the blurring kernel K, is actually a bigger kernel. Uh, so you can have actually nine by nine blurs or 11 by 11 blurs. And in the general case, basically where you have DNH, uh, we have a blurring kernel, which is typically unknown. And this is called blind restoration or blind super resolution because the blur kernel is typically unknown. And then a downsampling operation. So we have a combination of the two. So we just say, we blur the image, which is H times X. And then we downsample, that's the downsample arrow here. Uh, and this is N is the factor of downsampling. So you can downsample by two, four, eight, 16, whatever. And then we have additive noise. Now, all of these problems are ill problems. And uh, ill pose means the problem doesn't have a unique solution. Uh, so basically if you're uh, dealing with super resolution problem, for example, uh, you have a, let's say, downsampling by a factor of four. Uh, that means for each 16 pixels here in the observed image, you have, uh, in the ground truth image, you have only one pixel that is observed. And there, is, there are multiple ways, actually infinitely many ways, uh, to go from that one pixel to a super resolved image, which is four times four, times bigger basically than the uh, observed image. So in general, we have multiple solutions and possibly infinitely many solutions 
uh, to the super resolution problem. There are also infinite many solutions in the case of uh, deep learning problem because you have additive noise and uh, also the blur kernel uh, may have zero crossings, uh, which basically uh, makes the problem ill posed and uh, we don't have a unique solution. Now, uh, the problem is also called ill posed if the solution uh, depends discontinuously on input data. This is basically dealing with the noise. If you have small perturbations, which is noise in the observations, uh, these small perturbations to the observations may cause large variations in the estimated solution. Uh, this is another feature of ill posed problems. So basically, ill posed problems do not have a unique solution. And the solution, if it exists, uh, it depends on the uh, input data, observed data, you know, discontinuously. And as I said, many of the image and video processing problems are ill posed in this sense. For example, even the problem of motion estimation is ill posed uh, because you deal with the gradients there. And uh, the optical flow equation is basically a single equation in two unknowns. Uh, so that problem is also ill posed. So many of the image uh, and video processing problems are ill posed problems. So we have to have a fundamental way of dealing with ill posed problems. Now, in the early days when I was doing my PhD, uh, this, is, this was the only possible way of dealing with the problem, uh, model-based regularization. Uh, so if you set lambda equals zero, that is the regularization term, uh, then you get the least square solution. But the least square solution uh, is basically still an ill-posed solution because it depends on the data discontinuously. So small perturbations to the data uh, gives you large variations uh, in the least squares estimate. Um, and therefore we introduced this regularization function, R of X, <clears throat> and uh, lambda is a Lagrange multiplier and solve this regularized problem. Um, now there are many solutions that were developed in the past 40 years uh, to deal with this uh, regularized inversion uh, problem. Uh, the oldest one is Ticano regularization, which is the constraint least square solution. So we introduce a constraint here uh, to the least square solution. Uh, you can do total variation regularization, uh, which is basically uh, <clears throat> a constraint on the derivative of the solution. Uh, we have Lasso regularization, we have Bayesian regularization, we have sparse regularization. We assume X is a sparse basic solution uh, or the ground truth is sparse in some domain, some transform domain. Uh, that's also a regularization uh, constraint. Uh, so there are basically many, many solutions that were developed in the past 40 years. Uh, none of them are actually uh, satisfactory, I should say, uh, because uh, as I said, there are infinitely many solutions. And uh, when you choose a regularizer, uh, it basically selects one of these infinitely many solutions. And uh, there is clearly no uh, generally accepted definition of uh, the ideal solution or the best solution. Uh, so you can actually try to minimize the mean square error, but it's not really uh, relevant to the perceptual quality of the image. Uh, you try to optimize the perceptual quality of the image, but then you lose from fidelity. I will talk about those later. So there's no really uh, one uh, definition of the best solution uh, to this problem. So people use different regularizers here and get different solutions to the problem, uh, none of which are perfect, basically. Now, the new paradigm. The new paradigm doesn't actually try to look for a model as a regularizer. Uh, it uses the data as a regularizer. And uh, this is actually a form of regression. <clears throat> so the most common example of regression is, uh, let's say uh, you are given the height and the age of a group of people uh, and their weights as a training set. <clears throat> and then uh, there is a new person and you just give the height and the age of the person and try to predict his or her weight. Um, now, what you can do is you can actually uh, plot this available training data, uh, three-dimensional training data, um, and then try to fit some surface uh, to the data. 
the classic approach is linear regression. So if you have a three-dimensional uh, data, uh, you fit a plane uh, to the available data. And then when a new person uh, is introduced and his or her weight and age are given, you just project the point, uh, height and age point to this plane and predict the weights uh, from the plane, from what the plane predicts basically. Uh, now this has, uh, of course, uh, limitations because we, if you use a linear predictor, uh, then your prediction may not be good. Uh, you can try to use nonlinear prediction. Uh, this is nonlinear regression. Uh, then you have a regression surface, and you can still uh, give the height and age of the person and predict the weight uh, from this nonlinear surface. Now, the way we actually approach the uh, image and video uh, restoration and super resolution problem uh, using deep learning is actually very similar to this. Uh, what we now have <clears throat> as data, available data, pairs of ground truth and degraded images, X and Y. So those are the same X and Y mentioned here. Pairs of X and Y. Uh, except uh, these pairs of X and Y are now very high dimensional uh, data. Uh, so if you consider a very simple case of 100 by 100 image, 100 pixels by 100 pixels image, uh, that makes 10,000 dimensions because we count each pixel as a dimension. Um, and then basically you have uh, points in a very high dimensional space uh, that represents pairs of X and Y. So if you basically scatter these X, Y pairs in this very high dimensional space and try to fit a surface, uh, which we will call the manifold uh, to this data, uh, then when a new Y is given, uh, you can actually refer to the manifold and predict the corresponding X. That's basically regressive inference. So the regressive inference uh, fits a very high dimensional manifold uh, to the given X, Y pairs. And then when a new Y is given, it basically projects this Y to the manifold and predicts the corresponding H uh, for, for corresponding X. <clears throat> now, what affects the uh, solution here? Well, uh, clearly uh, the shape of the manifold is crucial and the shape of the manifold is affected by uh, the architecture of the regressor, that's your network, neural network architecture, and the loss function, and the training data. So these are the three pillars uh, that affect the accuracy of the solution. Um, so for different architectures, you have a different manifold estimate, different loss functions, you have a different manifold estimate. For different training data, you have different manifold estimates. And here are some examples, details. So uh, image, this is a deblurring problem, uh, blurred by 11 by 11 uh, uniform blur. And we add 40 decibels of noise on top of the blurred data. Uh, 40 decibels of noise is not visible to the eye, uh, but that's enough actually to uh, generate problems because the problem is ill-posed in the solution. Uh, but now if you use the uh, neural network, this is one of the early networks, uh, SR ResNet, uh, used for deblurring. Uh, you get almost perfect results. Uh, this is a comparison of, uh, again, nine by nine deblurring problem, uh, SR ResNet result on the right and the classical Wiener filter approach on the left. So Wiener filter was what I was using uh, as a benchmark when I was doing my PhD. Uh, and basically, as you can see, uh, there is noise in the background, uh, which we call basically um, regularization artifacts. <clears throat> so as a result of regularization, linear regularization, uh, you get some filtered noise artifacts. And then there is some ringing around 
uh, sharp edges. So you see this antenna uh, rings. Uh, well, none of that is visible uh, in the uh, basically learned solution. Uh, that's mainly because we are using a nonlinear estimate here or a nonlinear regression uh, for getting the estimate. So that's the power of nonlinear uh, signal processing. So actually, I view this uh, deep learning uh, not as AI, but uh, nonlinear signal processing. That's what my application calls for. <clears throat> uh, we are basically using nonlinear signal processing techniques uh, for uh, solving the inverse problems. And the nonlinear technique that we are using is deep learning, basically. And uh, <clears throat> this is the result of a times four uh, single image super resolution. Uh, we have the classical linear interpolation result uh, on the left and uh, the deep learning solution uh, on the right. And this is again obtained by SRSNet. So these are really uh, early networks, early neural networks, but they are very powerful as compared to the linear techniques, as you can see. Uh, there's blurring in the result of linear interpolation as expected, uh, which doesn't appear to be a problem with the nonlinear solution. <clears throat> okay, so now back to the three pillars. Uh, what affects that the regression surface uh, architecture? So we have regressed models and also generative models. I will also say a few words about generative models as time permits. And then uh, we have optimization and evaluation criteria. Uh, there is actually a uh, trade-off between uh, fidelity and perception. Fidelity and distortion are opposite of each other, basically. Uh, so if you want to incre increase the fidelity, it turns out that uh, you have to sacrifice from the perceptual quality. Uh, that's, that sounds counterintuitive, but I will explain why that happens uh, later. And the training data is important. Uh, we will see that uh, there is some model overfitting uh, that we have to deal with uh, in real life applications. So here are some early convolutional network architectures, uh, mainly developed by computer vision people. Uh, there was this uh, Lenet 5. Uh, well, actually, Jan Lekun is not a computer vision person. He's actually a signal processing person from his background, but uh, he was working on the character recognition problem in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, and uh, he developed this uh, very simple network called Lenet 5, uh, has only five layers, uh, which actually obtained extremely good results uh, for optical character recognition, handwritten character recognition, and vice, uh, so forth. Uh, it hasn't become very popular because basically uh, he developed this for the at and uh, company and uh, that was not open sourced. And also uh, there was no GPUs at the time. Uh, so the computational resources uh, required to run this network was not available to everybody. Uh, but some 20 years later, uh, there was this ImageNet uh, competition, uh, recognition, image and object recognition competition. And AlexNet, <clears throat> uh, actually this paper has received more than 100,000 citations and every time I check, it keeps increasing, uh, has made the convolutional networks famous. And I was wondering what happened in those 20 years. Basically, uh, the GPUs were invented around uh, 2000. And then people realized that they can implement these neural networks on GPUs that took another five, six years. Uh, so the period in between Lenet 5 and AlexNet is mainly uh, due to the availability of uh, GPUs and people learning to actually implement neural networks on GPUs. And also uh, this ImageNet data set, which has become available in late 2000s, basically, maybe 2010 or so. 
So those actually have contributed uh, to the success, GPUs and the data sets uh, to the success of neural networks starting from 2012. And then there were developments uh, that led to better and better network architectures. Uh, ResNet is an important step, uh, which made basically training deep networks uh, possible using the backpropagation algorithm. Of course, the introduction of backpropagation algorithm is another important milestone uh, in this uh, development because AlexNet actually uses backpropagation. Uh, and uh, well, LENET5 also uses backpropagation. Backpropagation was uh, introduced in 1986, I believe. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, ResNet and DanceNet, I would say, are important uh, advances in the architectures. Now, how these architectures affected uh, the super resolution and restoration problems, that's our subject today. Uh, the very first application of neural networks uh, to the image restoration and super resolution problem was this paper SRCNN, and only three layers. And uh, that's here, uh, so it had, it actually interpolated the low resolution image first using bicubic interpolation, and then processed this bicubically interpolated picture uh, with three layers of neural network. And even this very simple thing basically has resulted in about close to two dB improvement over the state of the art at the time. And 2 dB is a huge, basically, for our problem. Uh, today, we are struggling, basically, for 0.2 dB improvement. If you get 0.2 dB improvement over the state of the art, it's a big deal nowadays. So at that time, uh, just doing these three simple layers, he got almost 2 dB improvement uh, over the state of the art. And then, basically, uh, we have ResNet. In, when this paper was written, uh, there was no ResNet. Uh, at the time, uh, so he only used three layers because he wouldn't be able to train in a deeper network. Uh, with the introduction of ResNet, uh, we can now train uh, deeper networks. And uh, basically, EDSR uh, is an improved version of ResNet. <clears throat> now, uh, one of the improvements uh, is back actually uh, due to when to upsample. So as I said, uh, this SRCNN upsamples upfront uh, the input image and then processes the upsampled image, bicubically interpolated image. Now this is what we call pre-upsampling. And it was later shown that post-upsampling is actually better. So it can actually process the low resolution image with the neural network, uh, extract all the features uh, from the low resolution image and then use an upsampling layer at the end. And uh, this actually provided improvement in the results. So there is a single upsampling layer at the end after processing the low resolution image with the convolutional network. And uh, for the upsampling, uh, there are two alternatives. You can use transpose convolution for upsampling, uh, which is basically a learned upsampling filtering uh, process. A more efficient implementation of this is called the pixel shuffler. Uh, pixel shuffler actually uh, is inspired by polyphase filtering, uh, which we use in DSP, digital signal processing, uh, as an efficient means of filtering. Uh, so basically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it basically maps channels into the special dimensions. Uh, so we have uh, more channels with lower spatial resolution. Uh, and then we map these uh, channels uh, to spatial resolution by reordering the pixels or what they call shuffling the pixels. Uh, so basically uh, this pixel goes here and then the blue pixel goes spatially neighboring position and the light blue goes next and so forth. So this is an example of a three by three um, upsampling layer uh, where nine channels are actually uh, reorganized into a nine times bigger, spatially bigger picture. 
And of course, then there is a convolutional layer uh, to estimate or re-estimate the pixel values after the shuffling. Anyway, uh, so these are basically two options and the pixel shuffler is commonly used uh, upsampling layer in today's networks. And uh, this is the post upsampling approach. And then you have actually uh, super resolution by large factors uh, like eight or 16. Uh, people have tried progressive upsampling. Uh, this is called the Laplacian uh, pyramid approach. Uh, so LAP SRN, uh, LAP stands for Laplacian uh, pyramid. Uh, so you upsample by two, uh, do some more processing up sample by two again, do some more processing up sample by two again. Uh, that's how you do other factors of up sampling. Uh, in uh, the single up sampling approach, if you're up sampling by two, uh, you would just use uh, two times two uh, up sampling layers uh, back to back at the end. Uh, what they have done is actually separated the uh, up sampling layers with some convolutional layers in between. And then there is also this iterative up and down sampling approach. Uh, so you up sample and down sample, up sample and down sample. Uh, that's this uh, basically back projection network approach. Uh, anyway, I mean, these make some difference, but not really, really a huge difference in performance. Uh, now the ResNet actually makes a huge difference in performance because now we can actually train deeper and deeper networks. Uh, and EDSR is an improvement over the SRS net. Uh, the nature of the residual block has changed uh, from SRS net to EDSR. Uh, well, in the EDSR, they actually remove the batch norms and then obtain better results. So basically the original uh, residual block has uh, batch norms <clears throat> and then there is a ReLU at the end also. Uh, in the SR ResNet, they removed this last value. And in EDSR, they also removed the batch norms. So we now have a very simple residual block architecture, uh, which gets the best results for SR problem. And then DanceNet came on, and uh, we have now combinations of residual and dense blocks. Uh, dense blocks actually concat uh, the outputs of previous layers with the uh, inputs of the next layer. And uh, so this is another kind of uh, skip connection uh, where the skip connection in residual block is an additive uh, connection. Uh, the skip connections in the dense blocks are concat connections. And then some people actually combine them together. Uh, so they have both concat uh, short skips uh, and long skips and also uh, additive. Uh, basically skips, uh, which is called residual dense block. So this is the residual part and the dense connections uh, within the uh, trunk of the layer. Uh, each of these actually things uh, improve the results by a small amount, uh, but uh, I mean, we are getting to better and better uh, architectures. Uh, then uh, people introduce attention uh, the scaling attention, not the self-attention, but the scaling attention uh, into the residual architecture. <clears throat> uh, so basically, uh, there are two types of scaling attention. Uh, there is uh, channel attention, uh, which introduces a scale factor to the channels, uh, a learned scale factor to the channels. And there is also spatial attention, uh, which is basically scaling according to the spatial location within the channels. Uh, so you can use actually uh, spatial attention and channel attention together. Uh, and basically RCAN uh, is the network uh, which uses basically residual blocks and channel attention. And using channel attention, they show some, again, small minor improvements. So each of these basic things improve the results by 0.1 dB or so. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, th that's, what you can get from these type of uh, architectural improvements. And then uh, the latest basically here is the residual in residual dense blocks. Uh, the main idea in residual in residual dense blocks is uh, 
a combination of short skips and long skips. Uh, so we have the basic block, uh, which is shown here. Uh, the basic block contains three dense blocks cascaded. And then we have basically short skips over the dense blocks. So this is the residual connection basically over the dense blocks. Okay. And then uh, for every three dense blocks, we also have a long connection. So we have a short skip and a long skip connection. And then there is also an end-to-end -end skip connection. So we have three layers of skip connections in this residual and residual dense block architecture. Uh, with this improvement, or with this basically uh, three layers of skip connections, now they can train uh, up to 350 layers also. Uh, networks uh, with 350 convolutional layers. So it turns out that uh, if you don't use these uh, three layers of uh, skip connections, uh, even the ResNet, uh, you cannot train more than 150 layers. Uh, so the limit is for the ResNet architecture, the limit is uh, like 150 layers, uh, but introducing these three layers of uh, skip connections, that's the residual and residual dense block. Now you can train up to 300 layers, 350 layers. And the more layers, uh, the better the results. So there is another like 0.2 dB or 0.3 dB improvement uh, by going to 350 layers and three layers of skip connections. Uh, this is a just small table that provides a comparison of these uh, ResNet derivative architectures, I would call. Uh, it starts with EDSR. EDSR plus is a bigger EDSR uh, with 43 million parameters, uh, but it doesn't actually provide the best results. Uh, even if it has the most number of parameters, so I say here that it's not simply a matter of parameters, it's also a matter of architecture, how you actually introduce these skip connections uh, affects the results. So it turns out that with like 16 million parameters uh, and 351 layers, uh, you can get better results than EDSR plus just 43 million parameters. Now you can see that uh, EDSR has only EDSR plus has only 68 layers. Uh, so basically, they have more channel, more channels within each layer. Uh, the RRDB, that's the residual and residual dense block has 351 layers, but less number of parameters. This channel dimension is narrower. So actually making the channel dimension narrower and the depth bigger uh, gives you better results with less number of parameters. So that's what we can learn from these architectures. Now, uh, this is all about ResNet derivatives, uh, but now, uh, we have a new architecture in town. Uh, it's called the Vision Transformers or Visual Transformers. <clears throat> and um, these transformer architectures have been very successful in NLP, uh, Natural Language Processing. Uh, it's uh, actually a method uh, to process sequences uh, with uh, longer interactions. So, People try to adopt this transformer and self-attention idea uh, to images and video very, very recently. Uh, this is just within the last two years, I would say. <clears throat> and uh, the first application was uh, using a global self-attention uh, layer or two uh, to supplement the convolutional networks. So we have the convolutional trunk, ResNet trunk. Uh, in parallel to that, or in series connected to that, uh, we can add a few layers of uh, global self-attention. Now, global self-attention is a dot product attention. So it's like basically taking the dot product of the image by itself. It's something like that. And uh, you can think, to, think of this as a non-local means uh, filtering approach. Uh, which is popular in image processing. And in this basically architecture, every pixel attends to every other pixel. And then we basically either add these uh, features or concat those features, uh, try to get to the 
better results. Uh, this global self-attention uh, was proposed again by computer vision people for object detection uh, purposes. Uh, these two papers are vision papers, uh, not uh, super resolution papers. Um, now, another approach, uh, oh, uh, the main problem with global self-attention is its computational inefficiency. Uh, people try to propose also efficient self-attention and whatever, but still it's kind of a heavy computation uh, because of the global nature. So if you have basically a 1K by 1K image, uh, it's a huge amount of computation uh, to compute this global self-attention. Now, to make it more efficient, you can do it over local windows. But if you have local sliding window self-attention, uh, then you actually sort of lose the global picture, uh, but you can still actually supplement uh, convolutional layers with local self-attention. Uh, there is also this paper, which actually uses local self-attention as a standalone uh, network uh, for feature extraction again, for vision problems. Now, the vision transformers is a relatively newer uh, addition. Uh, it's basically segmenting the image into non-overlapping blocks and treat each block uh, of pixels. Uh, this can be two by two blocks or four by four blocks or eight by eight blocks as words in natural language processing. Then basically blocks, attend to other blocks. And this gives slightly better computational efficiency, but still too heavy uh, if you do it on a global basis. So the vision transformers uh, takes the whole picture and segments it into blocks, non-overlapping blocks, and then treats each basically block as a word and then extracts basically an embedding of it and then feeds it into a transformer. <clears throat> That's what vision transformers do. Now, the latest here is the shifted window transformer, or in short, SWIN transformer. Uh, the SWIN transformer actually uh, does this vision transformer thing uh, first hierarchically and also on shifted windows. So let me explain the two things here. Uh, one is basically the hierarchical approach. So you can actually think of it as a, a Laplacian pyramid. And on the top of the pyramid, you have a smaller picture. So this computation is more efficient. And then you actually propagate this computation to the lower layers of the pyramid with higher resolution. Uh, the second thing is uh, shifted windows. <clears throat> so these are not sliding windows, but shifted windows. So you basically can shift a window by half the window size or something like that. And within each window, uh, you have patches. So you have windows, and then within each window, you have patches. So you actually apply this vision transformer within windows, and then you can shift those windows across the image and then do it in a hierarchical way. Uh, so this gives you actually a very powerful image representation. Uh, there is actually a paper or two uh, just published recently, which uses SWIN transformers uh, for image restoration and super resolution, but this is very, very new. Okay, now that's all I have to say about the architectures. Let me say about a few things about uh, training and uh, evaluation of the results. Uh, well, the loss function. What, what loss function should be used? You can, of course, use fidelity loss. This is the standard approach uh, over the last 40 years, basically. Uh, you go and minimize the L2 loss or L1 loss or some approximation to the L1 loss, like Carbonier loss or Huber loss. Uh, but it turns out that uh, when you just minimize distortion, or maximize fidelity, the same thing. Uh, the results turn out to be not perceptually the best. Um, and I will explain why. Um, now, people come up with this generative adversarial networks, uh, which actually use a generator network and a discriminator network and uses the output of the dis discriminator network uh, 
uh, as a loss function for the generator. So it's like a feedback mechanism. Um, this was actually originally proposed for image synthesis. Uh, so they with some random numbers and synthesize images. When we use this in uh, super resolution or image restoration, uh, we start with blurred images here or uh, low resolution images here. So the generator network is just like the ResNet uh, or EDSR or whatever, basically. Uh, it simply gets a low resolution image and produces a high resolution image. The discriminator simply tries to discriminate whether this is actually a processed image or a ground truth image. Uh, the scheme works like that. So this is called conditional gun, basically, because we are actually conditioning the output on the input image. <clears throat> uh, so the very first proposal was in 2017 uh, called SR gun, super resolution gun. Uh, so they use the SR ResNet for the generator and a discriminator. Now, what is interesting here is that when you look at the results, uh, you can do two types of things. Uh, you can actually evaluate the results by objective metrics like PSNR or SSIM, or you can evaluate the results subjectively. You can collect a group of people and ask them to rate these pictures, output images uh, between zero and five, uh, zero being the worst and five being the best, and then take the average. So that's the mean opinion score. MOS stands for mean opinion score. <clears throat> Now, it turns out that uh, if you want to maximize the PSNR, <clears throat> you need to actually minimize the L1 loss or L2 loss. Uh, but then uh, the most scores are not the best. So you get 32 dB PSNR and 0 0.90 SSIM, and your most is 3.37. Now, if you Use a gun uh, with adversarial loss here, which is the output of the discriminator. Uh, your PSNR is down by almost two and a half dB, <clears throat> uh, but your MOS score goes up. So people actually prefer the output of the gun better than the simple L1 or L2 regressor network. But the fidelity is lower. And this is actually a consistent behavior across almost all data sets. So this is the set 14. You see that, again, there is about uh, two and a half dB difference between the PSNRs uh, being the regressive network better. Uh, but the most scores are now even worse on the set 14. Uh, in BSD 100, the same thing. Uh, the most scores are much worse, whereas the PSNR is almost two and a half dB higher. So this is a very consistent observation. People prefer to look at the results of guns, but they are not high fidelity. And the gun network actually has also evolved. Uh, the latest uh, version of it is called Enhanced SR Gun, ESR Gun, uh, which has a better generator, the RRDB and the better discriminator and so forth. But now let's come to the main thing. Why, why, do, why, do, why people prefer uh, the results of GAN and why the PSNR is lower? Well, the thing is uh, GANs actually hallucinate picture. So if you look at these two pictures, uh, the GAN result looks sharper, uh, but it's almost 3 dB lower in PSNR. So what this, actually implies is, uh, yes, we have more texture here, but that's not real, that's hallucinated. So the PSNR is lower. Uh, the PSNR of this picture is higher. So when you show these pairs of pictures to people, of course, people prefer the one on the right, uh, but the one on the left has higher fidelity. So there is a basically trade-off between perception and distortion. Uh, and there is a paper actually published by Blau and Mikhaili, uh, which elaborates on the theoretical uh, foundations of this trade-off, basically, why there is a trade-off. And the theoretical explanation of this is the following. Uh, when you regress, 
uh, you regress towards the mean of a distribution. And uh, in the case of images, uh, if you take 100 images and take the average of these 100 images, uh, that's not a real image, basically. If you take the average of two images, it's not necessarily a natural image. Uh, it's kind of blurred. Uh, so regressor, regression, basically, algorithms uh, try to estimate uh, the mean of the a posterior distribution of the high resolution image uh, distribution, uh, which looks like this, uh, has high PSNR. Uh, but if you actually just sample one or two images from the distribution, they are more like natural images, uh, but not necessarily with high fidelity. So that's basically the idea of perception distortion trade off. And, uh, basically, what we have to do is to choose uh, one or the other, <laughs> it turns out. Um, now, this is counterintuitive, probably, because you can say that if I somehow estimate the ground truth image magically, uh, then it has basically uh, high perceptual quality and high PSNR. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you cannot estimate that with an existing algorithm. So basically, uh, there are infinitely many solutions, and the ground truth image is just one of these solutions. Uh, your probability of estimating that is zero, basically. Uh, so you have to live with this trade uh, So, Murat, do they also perform comparative uh, subjective tests? Uh, in the subjective tests, uh, they actually have done everything. Uh, they did comparative tests. They did one by one scoring of the images. Uh, in every case, people actually prefer uh, the result of them. So, I mean, if you look at these side by side, uh, you definitely will prefer the right, right image. If you look at them one by one, you still <laughs> prefer the right image. So it doesn't really change the result. No, I mean, with, with respect to ground truth, uh, would it possible to spot out those two images are different, for example? Uh, with respect ground to truth, truth, yes. Uh, well, I mean, it turns out that the human eye is not very uh, good sensor. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> 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 yeah, your eyes will not probably spot those uh, hallucinated texture from the real texture. I see. Then, basically, uh, uh, maybe then the gun is uh, the the way to go. Well, except for basically information, what I call information centric applications, because if you are trying to basically detect whether a digit is a three or an eight. Uh, well, the gun will tell you it's eight. <laughs> and you will look at it and say, oh, this is a real eight. But the reality, maybe it may be three, I mean, because gun just hallucinates it. Um, so, I mean, I would hesitate to use gun results in information centric applications. But if you're in aesthetic centric application, definitely go for gun. Okay, now. Uh, we actually evaluate. We're at the jam. Yes. Uh, we have, I guess, the last 10 minutes or five, 10 minutes. Last five minutes. Okay. I'll try to finish in five minutes. Um, okay. Uh, we evaluate this perceptual quality uh, using a couple of different measures. Uh, there are actually many, many uh, perceptual quality measures, uh, but uh, people have tried. Uh, many of them and decided at the end to use a combination of this MA index and the Nike index, uh, which is called the PI perception index. Uh, so in most of the uh, perception distortion uh, experiments, people use the PI index to measure the perceptual quality and they use uh, the PSNR uh, to actually evaluate the uh, distortion. Okay, now there is also this flow-based methods, uh, flow-based generative models, flow-based generative inference. Now, flow methods uh, estimate an invertible mapping uh, that takes a distribution of uh, real images, uh, basically a distribution of real images, and maps them uh, to an IID Gaussian. So 
The network actually learns to map the distribution of real images into an IID Gaussian. And since this mapping is invertible, uh, you can actually start with IID Gaussians and use the inverse of this learned mapping and construct the image distribution. And then you can sample from that distribution. Uh, this is actually a generative model, uh, more recent than the GAN. Uh, the main advantage of this generative approach, the flow-based generative approach, it's more stable to train. And you can actually sample multiple images from the same model uh, because you start with an IID uh, Gaussian uh, and you can change the seed of the IID Gaussian and you can sample multiple images uh, from the same distribution using the same model, same invertible model. And we actually had a study uh, on this uh, approach and how we can use the uh, flow-based models for perception distortion uh, optimization. Uh, this uh, large circle, uh, we submitted this to ICEP 2022, so it's under review. Uh, this large distribution uh, or this large circle uh, actually signifies the distribution of uh, flow-based images that are sampled from the same distribution. And then by using different techniques, we can actually uh, map these images to uh, other images uh, which have different perception distortion trade-offs. So basically the flow samples are all concentrated around this circle by, for example, averaging 25 of those images, we can actually go to a better uh, perception distortion trade-off point, or you can actually use a fusion network, post-fusion network, to fuse those samples uh, to go to a better perception distortion trade-off. So if you're interested in the details, uh, John uh, can send you the paper. Uh, now, the last thing, very, very fast, uh, the training data. Uh, well, the training data is a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, now, for these techniques to work successfully, uh, the degradation model in the training set uh, should match the degradation model in the test set. Uh, if the degradation models are different, uh, the results degrade pretty quickly. So if I basically have nine by nine blurs in the training set, and 13 by 13 blurs in my test set, uh, the results are not good. And this is quite expected because this is an inverse problem. So you are basically trying to find the inverse mapping of the nine by nine blur. And you train the network to learn the inverse mapping of the nine by nine blur and apply it to a 13 by 13 blur, uh, you're not gonna get good results. So that's what we observe anyway. So this is what we call the model overfitting. Uh, I don't have time left to discuss the solutions. There are some solutions to this approach, basically, uh, how to actually deal with uh, variation of the degradation model uh, between the test set and training set. Uh, I won't talk about those now. Uh, just say a few words about the video processing architectures, uh, because video processing is also very important, and we can also get very successful results for video processing using learned uh, architectures. Now, the trivial extension of uh, convolutional nets to video is to use 3D convnets. So we add time as a dimension and uh, use three-dimensional convolutions. That would be the trivial extension, but that's not computationally efficient. Uh, the more computationally efficient architectures are stacked 2D representations. So you stack five frames and fit it as a set of five inputs to a single 2D network. This is computationally more efficient. Uh, even better is you can use a recurrent network architecture. You can use a convolutional LSTM uh, and variations of the convolutional LSTM to model uh, the blur. Now, the key thing is if you use either of these 2D or recurrent network approaches, uh, you have to uh, somehow do motion compensation uh, before you feed them, uh, feed those frames uh, to the network. Uh, this is kind of obvious because you need to register these frames if you're gonna stack them as a single input to a 2D network. Uh, but even in the case of the recurrent architectures, uh, you, you may expect that the recurrent architecture will figure out the motion, uh, but 
if the motion is large, uh, the return network is not going to be able to do it. So people actually use uh, some kind of motion compensation using deformable convolutions before feeding uh, the frames into a recurrent network. So you have a pre-processing, which is motion compensation, uh, followed by a recurrent architecture to take care of the three-dimensional uh, basic nature of the data. Uh, so this is basically the prevalent approaches, uh, multi-frame convolutional networks with feature alignment or recurrent networks. So these are both are state of, both are giving state of dart results nowadays for video processing. Uh, EDV is a uh, network, so they use basically uh, deformable convolutions to align these pictures uh, before they fit it to the reconstruction model. Uh, and then uh, the basic VSR and basic VSR++ plus plus, a recurrent architecture. Um, but it uses also alignment. So uses alignment and recursion uh, simultaneously. Uh, now, just want to say two last things before I finish. Uh, this is work I'm doing with my students. Nasrin is working on perceptual video SR. So I mentioned about this uh, perception distortion trade-off in image uh, super resolution and restoration. Uh, of course, the same trade-off exists for video uh, super resolution and restoration. Uh, but it's actually a more difficult problem in video. Uh, because when you say perceptual quality of video, it's not just spatial texture, uh, there is also motion consistency. Uh, so if you have perfect spatial texture, uh, but there is jitter in the temporal direction, the perceptual quality of the resulting video is not good. Uh, people are very sensitive. I said human eye is a bad sensor, uh, but it detects jitter very efficiently and easily. So if there is jitter in the video, uh, you can definitely detect that. So what we have done is uh, we modified this uh, spatial distortion and uh, perception measures into spatial temporal distortion and spatial temporal perception measures. Um, frame PSNR, I call it frame PSNR because when you evaluate PSNR for video, you actually evaluate it by frame by frame. So when you actually have PSNR measured for the video, it doesn't really measure temporal quality. Okay, uh, so if you want to include a measure of temporal distortion, you have to also account for the motion errors or any jitter that you would introduce by processing the video. Uh, so we introduced this flow MSE into the PSNR uh, as an additive, basically, uh, distortion. And Nike, Nike is a very nice, actually, measure of perceptual quality of texture alone. Uh, so if you want to include the temporal dimension, uh, there is a metric called perceptual straightness. Uh, this is developed by psychologists um, who study human vision system. Uh, so we actually adopted that metric and added to Nike. So now we evaluate spatial temporal perception as Nike plus perceptual straightness and uh, spatial temporal distortion as PSNR plus flow MSE. And we submitted a paper to ICIP 2022 again under review. Uh, and we show that basically uh, with two discriminators, one uh, spatial discriminator and one motion discriminator, uh, we can get better perceptual straightness than any other met measure, any other method basically available now. So we get the best uh, perceptual straightness measure using two discriminators. And one last thing is work I'm doing with Ron Lee. Uh, this is about uh, video deinterlacing. Uh, the interlacing is a relatively simple problem, you can guess, because uh, the model has no variation. So there is no uh, variability in the deinterlacing model. The deinterlacing degradation is fixed model, basically. So you can actually develop 
uh, learned algorithms that that will work for all the interlacing problems uh, the same way. <clears throat> we don't have this model overfitting problem here. Um, and the novelty here is uh, we are using the formal uh, alignment model uh, like the DVR, uh, but we also added the global self-attention uh, in parallel. And we are basically using the formal alignment together with self-attention in this scheme. And our method is actually uh, getting state-of-the-art results according to this benchmark site. Uh, wrong maze method is cited first in this uh, benchmark uh, site, uh, benchmark basic the website. Uh, so we also submitted a paper to ICIP 2022 uh, based on his results. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, I think I'm just a few minutes late, but uh, that's usually what I do. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop here and take. Thanks a lot, Bojong. Uh, so we can take questions if you can raise your hand. Maybe I talk too much for people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I, I think some <laughs> people just had to let had to leave. Can I ask a short question? Yes. Please ah, go. Uh, what, what is the impact of this upsampling procedure in the perception quality, especially given that super resolution is important for visual perception, etc.? So you, you you said that you're using mostly uh, transpose uh, convolution, right? Uh, we are actually using the pixel shuffler. Uh, transpose convolution uh, you can also use, but pixel shuffler is more efficient uh, in terms of computations. Uh, so it's like the polyphase filtering, basically. Uh, so we are using pixel shuffler for inter uh, for upsampling. Yes. So is it upsampling followed by convolution? Yes, there is actually a convolution after the pixel shuffler layer. Okay. Pixel because shuffler they... shuffles the pixels, and then there is a convolution layer that follows uh, that does the reconstruction. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes. I can respond. Uh, Murutucan, thanks a lot for the talk. I want to ask one question about this perception distortion trade-off uh, issue. You mentioned that it was impossible to um, optimize the two together. Yes. But in information-centric applications, you mentioned there is the single HR image, which is the true ground truth image. So doesn't that like exactly do what you're referring to? Like once you have the HR image, you get best possible PSLR yes. and yes, perception, yes. right? Uh, there is one uh, ground truth image, but I cannot estimate it. I mean, there is no algorithm to estimate it. So the current algorithms can't estimate it, but it's not fundamentally impossible, I guess, right? That, that's uh, it's fundamentally impossible. That's uh, what the Blau and Michele paper shows. Uh, basically, uh, well, I mean, it's a zero probability event. Uh, now, as I said, these are ill-posed problems. There are infinitely many solutions. And the true solution is just one of them. Uh, so your chances of getting an algorithm to estimate the true solution is, imp uh, is basically zero probability. OK, OK. Uh, and more technically, if you go back to this uh, Blau and Mikhaili paper, uh, they show that uh, basically the mean of a discrete distribution uh, is not a sample from the distribution. So I mean, and, just think the extreme case, a binary image. Uh, if you take two binary images and average them, you don't get a binary image, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get a continuous numbers, basically. It's not binary anymore. So I mean, uh, they say that if you have a discrete distribution, and if you take samples from this discrete distribution and average them, the mean or the average is not a sample of the distribution. And basically, when you do a regression uh, with L1 loss or L2 loss, uh, you're either getting the median or the mean of the distribution, uh, which may or may not be a real image. 
Okay, so, so the fundamental trade-off says there might be some ways to get better curves in terms of perception and uh, distortion, but you won't be able to, with high probability, you won't be able to get the exact solution. Yeah, that's, I guess, uh, that's exactly what we are saying. Uh, okay. You can go towards different points in the perception distortion plane, uh, depending on your application. If your application is aesthetics, then by all means go to the perception direction. But if your application requires precision of information, uh, then you have to care for fidelity. And when you care for fidelity, uh, your perception quality will drop. Uh, and uh, the non-obvious part is finding the best trade-off point between perception and distortion. You can go to the extreme perception, extreme fidelity, but you can also go somewhere in between. Where you should go in between is not clear at all, basically. Okay, okay, thanks a lot, Sujan. Maybe a quick question, Rotojab. Thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful as well. Uh, well, uh, about the perception and distortion, there is for sure, as, as you mentioned, an achievable region. Uh, yeah. So do you foresee any ways uh, that say that we can redefine the distortion metrics from what we have learned so far from the perceptual loss information so that the achievable region can be expanded in a way that hopefully we can go yes. to the ground truth somehow? Yes, if you actually look at the Blau and Mikhaili paper, they say that uh, the achievable region uh, depends on the distortion function that you use. Uh, so for some distortion functions, and by the way, they define a distortion function as any function which refers to the ground root. So for full reference metric in the image uh, quality assessment lingo, uh, these are called full reference measures. So any full reference measure, even LTIPS, for example, is actually a distortion measure because it refers to the original. Now, again, in their lingo, uh, a perception measure is a measure that doesn't refer to the original. So it's a no reference measure. So any no reference measure can be used as a perceptual metric. Any full reference measure can be used as a distortion metric. That's what they say. And then basically, uh, the achievable region is a function of what distortion measure and what perception measure that you use. But the key here is that the perception metric should be no reference. Mm -hmm. So both basically Ma and Nike are no reference metrics. And of course other no reference metrics. So for example, the perceptual straightness measure that we use for video is also a no-reference metric. All right. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? If that's not the case, uh, I want to thank the speaker again for this inside, in, insightful talk. Uh, it was a nice overview of all these techniques and uh, we also got a lot of information on what is still lacking, <laughs> uh, how humans can be tricked so easily. And it seems like there is room for improvement in that area. Yes, yes, there is lots of research to be done in this area. Okay, and thanks for uh, participating, everyone. And I hope to see everyone next week as well. Thank you. Thank you.